gave it all You took the fall And paid it all You Picked me up With your love Which I did not deserve Mercy on me Watch my feet, I'm whole again And me a fire burns Mercy on ending grace Never failing love Overwhelming you pour out your blessings You gain it all for me When your love is overwhelming When you pour out your blessings Good morning and welcome to Exciting Central Tampa Baptist Church Worship Service. We really are excited that you chose to worship with us today. Today is the first Sunday of the month and so we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper at the end of service. So please get your crackers and your juice, your grape juice, and join us at the end of service where Deacon Anderson will be officiating the Lord's Supper. We would also like to remind you that you can give any prayer requests you have during the service. You can comment online or if you have a private prayer matter, you can call the church office and share that with us. Our prayer team is always available 24-7 and we'll love to pray for you. As we segue into the service, we would like you to join us in worshiping God in spirit and truth. 
God, we come before you and we want to thank you for your blessings. Thank you for this day that you made and you gave to us. God, we pray that you, o Spirit, would be with us as we worship you. Father, we pray that we would hear from the word and that we would hide it in our hearts, that it would grow and that we would be able to learn more about you and be able to bless others with the word. Father, we come before you with open arms and open hearts and we worship you. You are a good father. You are a loving father. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, is my song. Let the King of my heart be the shadow.
worshiping God with our tithes and offering. God set an example for us when he gave. He gave the best and he gave the first his son. And that's what he requires of us. It is not just a financial transfer of funds, but it is an attitude of giving. We give God the best and we give God the first. I remember a couple years back when the Holy Spirit convicted me of this, when I was busily writing a check during the offertory prayer. I was giving, but I wasn't giving with the right attitude. I remember my mom would cash her check and would take her tithes and offering and put it in her Bible and keep it there until the Sunday when she went to church to pay her tithes and offering. That was her way of honoring God. As we give, as, and, and you have give generously. As we give, let us keep in mind the attitude with which we give. Let us give God our best and our first because that's what he did for us. Thank you. Oh, wow. Look at the monitor. I'm inside of my heart. Oh, my goodness. Wow. That was cool. That was cool. Well, I can't, I can't waste you know, a video like this. Let me take the opportunity to say, to say to all my mothers that you are in my heart. You are in my heart. We wish you Happy Mother's Day in advance, and we invite all you mothers next week to tune in uh, during Mother's Day. My own mother, who is going to be 99 years old on Mother's Day, and she is healthy, and she's doing well, and she definitely is in my heart. Hallelujah. It's a joy. I am uh, Pastor Lennox Zamor of Exciting Central Tampa Baptist Church. And it's, it's such a joy to come into your, from, from my house to yours, coming into your house, coming into your cars, your, your phones, your iPad, wherever church is for you right now. Uh, we just want to welcome you and we thank you for the opportunity and privilege it is to minister to you and to have you follow us and listen to us, and certainly like us, uh, we, we would appreciate that. I also want to encourage many of you um, to do your own watch party. Um, if you like what you are hearing, uh, do a watch party or send it to a friend. We appreciate that. Well, let's get into the word. At Exciting Central Tampa Baptist Church, we begin with an affirmation, and I want you to repeat after me. <clears throat> My spirit is God-breathed. God's word is God-breathed. Therefore, God's word gives me life. I am ready to hear it. I am ready to heed it. I am ready to be transformed. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your goodness and grace. And we pray that your presence be with us and be manifested through the anointing of your word to the hearts of every hearer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Today we are talking about the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of knowledge. And uh, we, we are continuing our series called Spiritual Bootcamp. We said that God created human beings to be spirits, just like himself. He created us in his image and he gave us a physical body and a soul. All spirit behavior, therefore, is purpose-directed. Everything a spirit does has purpose. Everything. And the ultimate purpose of the spirit is to reveal God on earth. That was God's plan. And he wants to reveal himself to you in all kinds of ways. For some people, he's going to make you prosperous. For some people, he's going to make you mighty. Whatever way he wants to reveal himself through you, but be sure that whatever it is, God wants you to be great. He wants you to have dominion. God did not create himself a body. He remained a spirit, allowing the embodied human being to have dominion over the earth and to accomplish his purpose. He will accomplish his will through the human being. It's beautiful. 
So he gave us free will. Free will to cooperate with him in the governance of earth. Or not to, if we so desired. Our spirits provided God, uh, provided us God consciousness and the capacity to interact with the spirit world. Our rational soul gave us self-consciousness and the ability to actually do our own will. But something happened that resulted in the expulsion of the creator and the sequestration of human beings from the heavenly realm, the spirit realm. What happened there in the Garden of Eden had to do with my subject today, knowledge, knowledge. So for the first point in my sermon, let's talk about the conspiracy of knowledge. The conspiracy of knowledge. God created humanity with the capacity to know him, to experience and to express him. Think about that. God created you with the capacity not just to know him, but to express him. And there is no greater knowledge in the entire universe than that, to know God. God designed Adam and Eve to live in a morally pure environment. And so he gave them access to everything he created. Everything. He said it was good. And he gave them access to it. Except he prohibited one thing and one thing only. He said you cannot partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the desire for that prohibited knowledge was and still is the greatest problem of humanity. Genesis 2 and verse 8 records the narrative of, of what happened. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man who he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We have to jump now to verse uh, 16. Genesis 2.16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but the tree of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat in the day that you eat thereof, surely you shall die. And so God set the law and the boundaries that would limit man's happiness. Everything but the one thing. Now long before the creation of man, God had already created angels. Angels with varying ranks and varying functions. He created archangels, he created cherubim, seraphim. And most glorious among all of them was a cherub called Lucifer. The name Lucifer means light bearer. But Lucifer tragically mounted a coup against God in heaven. He tried to become like God, to take God's place. And was able to persuade one third of the angelic beings to follow his madness. Well, God took care of it and ejected him from the kingdom of God called heaven. God then created the material universe and created a splendorous being in his image. That being would become also a cherub. He would guard the presence of God. So God's Arch enemy Lucifer sees an indirect opportunity to accomplish his sordid purpose, his audacious plan to be like God, to become God. Since man was created to be like God, he could accomplish his purpose through man. He could become like God through man. 
So he proceeded to exploit the man through the man's own God-created constitution. God had created man a spirit like himself, uh, and through the spirit, he would communicate and relate with the man. But he also gave the man his own self-consciousness, an immaterial self called the soul. God created man a tripart being just like himself and provided him three hierarchical executors in his constitution for the purpose of epistemology, a big word, it means to know. Man would get to know things through those three uh, parts of his constitution. God gave him a body, and the executor of the body would be his senses. <clears throat> Everything the body needed to discern, the sense would tell it. The hearing, the sight, the taste, the smell, the feel, these, these would communicate directly to the brain, to the body. But that was not a sufficient executor to determine moral right and wrong. Because not everything that sounds good is good. Not everything that tastes good is good. Not everything that looks good is good. So God created a higher executor. He created the soul. The soul provided emotion, intellect, and will, and its executor is reason. That's how it knows what it knows. The soul wants it to make sense. It has to be rational for the soul. But everything that is reasonable may not be true. Because something sounds correct doesn't mean it's correct. As a matter of fact, man's reason has become so bad that man sometimes calls evil good and good evil. So God had to create a higher executor. So God uh, created the executorship of the conscience. And it is through the spirit, the conscience is part of the spirit, that's how he would communicate to man. If God has to say something to you, it's going to be through the spirit and through the executorship of the conscience. That was God's, man was God's crowning creation. But it provided Lucifer his malevolent opportunity, the opportunity to divide and conquer, as he always does. True to his name and character, he would enlighten man by appealing to the lower executor in man. He would appeal to human reasoning, bypassing the agency of the spirit and the conscience through which God communicates. He would go directly to reason. Adam lived in perfect communion with God. There was complete faith and trust between he and God. And that was what Lucifer was after. That faith. That trust. He got the man to rationalize. Rationalize God's word. Got the man to uh, suspect God for not seeking his best interest. Uh, he, he, he got the man to rationalize that God somehow was concealing something that was significant to make him like God. And if it was God's intent for the man to express him, he should not have limited that. And the man began to think about it, ponder it, process it through his own executorship, which is his own sense of reason, and he made his own decision and acted on it outside of God. The temptation, as always, had enough truth in it to sound reasonable. But everything that is reasonable is not true. He opened the eyes of the man. Lucifer, the light bearer, has light. He is able to provide light. He is able to open your eyes. But he always opens your eyes in the interest of self. It's called carnal living. He never opens your eyes. In fact, cannot open your eyes towards God. Only towards himself and towards yourself. 
He got the man to believe that since he had been created like God, God would not impose the limitation, should not have imposed the limitation uh, of, the, of the knowledge, the knowledge of good and evil. That the only way to get that knowledge would be for his eyes to be open, and the only way for his eyes to be open would be for him to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Look at chapter 3 and verse 5 of Genesis. It says, For God does know that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as God's knowing good and evil. He knew that God had given Adam the kingdom colony called earth. He knew that Adam had full dominion and legal authority over earth. So when he attacked Eve, God did not interfere, would not interfere, because he would have been breaching the own condition he set. It was the responsibility of the man who had dominion to take care of this, to interfere, but he did not. God did not interfere. He would only intervene at the request of the man. But the man did not pray. The man did not request. He took matters into his own hands for he himself was so inclined as the woman. To better understand the significance of what is going on, you have to understand what the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil are. So let's, let's, let's go there. Let's go there. I know you've been hearing about this a lot and you've been, you, you may have been wondering, well, what is that? What is that tree? I promised you last week that we will talk about it, and so let's go there. The tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil are, are figures of speech called merisms. A merism. A merism is an idiomatic expression of totality through polarity. Totality through polarity. Let me give you some examples of merisms. Psalms chapter 103 and verse 12. The psalmist says, As far as the east is from the west, so far God has removed our transgressions from us. There you see a merism. This is not literal. God did not put our transgressions in the coordinates of east and west. This is simply expression of totality. He's trying to show you that God took care of it totally by putting it as far east and far west. Let's look at another one. Let's look at Psalm 139, verse 8. If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, you are there. He is not trying to say that God actually resides in hell. Uh, no, what he's saying is God is everywhere. He's showing polarity to show totality. That's all he's showing. These are figures of speech. Let's look at another one in Isaiah chapter 57 and verse 18. It says, I have seen his ways and I will heal him. I will also lead him and restore comforts to him. And to the mourners, I create the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace to him who is afar off and to him who is near, says the Lord. There is your figure of speech. He is talking normally and all of a sudden he goes into poetry. He says, near, near. Peace, peace to him who is far off and to him who is near, says the Lord, I will heal him. Far off and near means everyone. It's a way of saying everyone. Let's look at one final merism and that is Psalm 113 verse 3. From the rising of the sun to the going, going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. He is again showing that God's name should totally always be praised by showing polarity. That's what he's showing. So the phrase, the knowledge and good of good and evil, is merely a merism in Hebraic idiomatic expression to mean all knowledge, omniscience. Good and evil means everything. God had never intended for man to know everything. You don't want to tell your children everything. 
That's why they don't know the coordinates of the safe where your guns are. They can't handle that knowledge. There are some things they can't handle, although they may want it. This is what God did not want Adam to have. That knowledge is man's greatest problem. God invited Adam and Eve to partake freely of the tree of life. C can you imagine? And they never did. The tree of life was an invitation to perpetually share the life of God. An invitation to live in permanent obedience and submission to God. A relationship of union, unity with God. Being in Christ, being one with God permanently. Both the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil allude to relationships. God was telling Adam and Eve, you can live in union and dependency upon me forever, or you can take matters into your hands to decide what is in your best interest for yourself. You could do that. But if you do, you will also have to pay the consequence, and that is death. You can depend on me for your moral guidance or provide the conditions that would guarantee your own happiness and emancipate me from your kingdom. But without me, your spirit will die. It will die spiritually, immediately, and your body would die eventually. Now, this choice appears to be a no-brainer, but it reveals the power of the desire for knowledge, that even after God gave them such a clear proposition, man still became curious and inquisitive for the knowledge of good and evil. He wanted access to the flow of divine information. So Adam chose to rebel. Now we can blame Adam uh, retrospectively. Uh, but the truth is every human being has the same choice to make. Accept Jesus Christ as Lord and live in accordance with his will. Or run your own life without God and suffer the eternal consequence with the devil. Everyone has that same choice to make. You have that choice to make. When Adam and Eve partook of the fruit, their eyes were opened as Lucifer had intimated. But what he didn't tell them was that they would lack the moral constitution to do good that they knew and to avert evil that they knew because their souls were ill-equipped to be the organ of moral choice because the spirit had died. The only worse thing than that was for them to eat the tree of life and remain in that state forever. God could not have that happen. And so he enacted a plan. He would forego the tree of life until he could clean man up, until he would redeem man, until he could pay the penalty of sin for man, and then he could have the tree of life so he can live in a united relationship with God forever. That was the plan. Here's what God said in Genesis 3.22. Then the Lord said, Behold, the man has become like one of us. That's what God says. To know good and evil. So he did accomplish it. He has become like one of us. And now, lest he put his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat it and live forever, let's eject him get rid of the tree of life once armed with the knowledge of good and evil there is no need for God 
This declaration of independence from the kingdom of God did the worst thing possible to humanity. It separated us from the relationship, from the dependent relationship we had with God. It separated us from perpetual, unending connection and dependency on God. It separated us from the tree of life. That is life. To be connected with God permanently, forever. Adam's decline of moral accountability gave him moral autonomy through the executorship of the soul that was not designed to handle moral choice. And so man is in a moral dilemma. He is trying to conduct morality through the implement of rationality. That's the issue. This was and still is the signature modus operandi of Lucifer, the angel of light, to open the eyes of, of man to his own reasoning. He magnifies our limitations, then creates the desire for a reasonable alternative that would get you the prohibited desire outside of the purpose and will of God. The devil wants you to be happy without God. He wants you to feel satisfied without God, knowing that that is only short-lived as his own life is. Because at the end, separation from God permanently is guaranteed. So he opens the eyes of human reasoning. The eye is a, a reference to the faculty of light. The, the devil is an angel of light, and so he opens the eyes of human reasoning, uh, influencing us to see things our way. To Frank Sinatra, to do it my way. Which results in man pursuing his own purpose and his own will instead of God's purpose and God's will for which he was created. All over the globe today, man is busy doing his own thing lost from the kingdom of God, cut off, sequestered from the heavenly realm. Human reasoning, therefore, is the nemesis of faith and the biggest barrier to seeing in the spirit. Most people listening think it doesn't make sense and they won't pursue. Knowledge is the currency of consciousness that interconnects life and it comes either through relationship with God, which is the tree of life, or through relationship with Lucifer via human reasoning, which is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For me to pursue moral life outside of the spirit of God. For me to be ethical but not moral. For me to be good but not righteous. So out of love, God denied fallen man from partaking in the tree of life in their fallen state and decided to send his son, Jesus Christ, as the second Adam, to send him to pay the penalty of our sins. When you accept Jesus' offer of salvation, you are born again and partake of his life. You are connected to the very life of God. Christ said, I come that you might have life and have it abundantly. That's the tree of life. When you accept Jesus Christ as Lord, you become connected with God. You are connected with the life of God. And because Jesus is the tree of life, the born again believer walking in the spirit has access to the eternal flow of knowledge. Listen, if someone who is born again lives completely under the control of the Holy Spirit, you get access to a flow of knowledge, a river of knowledge that is infinite. You will perform like Christ performed. You will know the thoughts of men, the intents of men. God will reveal to you through knowledge 
any and everything you need to know to accomplish his will. God will bring you into the spirit flow, the spirit realm, the heavenly realm, and you will be able to perform things with knowledge access that no other human being has. You have a right to that tree when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. You can't have a right to that tree and not have the tree of life. This is facilitated for us. This access to the river of knowledge is, 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 is facilitated for us by the spirit of knowledge. A persona of the Holy Spirit that assists us and he is called the spirit of knowledge. The unregenerated human on the other hand does not have the mind of Christ. The believer has the very mind of Christ. God said, you have God's mind. You have the mind of Christ. But for the one who's outside of Christ, his world is one of self-advancement. He's preoccupied with humanism. It is his religion to advance himself, perfect himself. That's what most people do every day. Get the best they can to make themselves good without regard for the divine purpose for which God has created them. Man wants the privilege and prerogative of knowledge without the person of knowledge. So, guided by his own reasoning, he lives his life for his own desire and pursues his own will, eternal hell notwithstanding. Humanity is basking in his own unrighteousness and material glory enthralled by his own intellect and quarantined from the life of God and the divine supernatural spirit world, man is in a mad race for more and more knowledge. And the more knowledge we get is the more sorrow we get. Ecclesiastes 1.18 says, For in much wisdom is much grief, grief, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. You, if you want to know everything, it's going to cost you some pain. Because you don't know the end from the beginning. God is the alpha and the omega. He can handle it. There are some things you don't need to be knowing. The increase of knowledge comes with pain. The thirst for knowledge is the driving force of all civilization. It was that way at the beginning, and the Bible says it shall be that way at the end. Daniel 12, 4 tells that to us. He says, many in the, la in the end, he says, well, let me read the whole verse. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase towards the end. Daniel foresaw the age that we are now in. An information age, an age that is cyber, an age where we have access to all kinds of knowledge instantaneously at the click of a mouse or simply opening our mouth and tell Siri to get it for us. We have knowledge. A time when our thirst for knowledge and information will lead into the culmination of the devil's deception that began in the garden. A time when the, ro the whole world will unite against its creator in a final culmination of what happened in the Garden of Eden. And I believe that this time of this coronavirus that has thrust the entire world into a cyber vortex may very well introduce to us the biometrics that will make the whole world be trackable. Those who have eyes to hear, uh, ears to hear, let them hear. And those who have eyes to see, let them see. Let's go to the connotation of knowledge. The Hebrew word for knowledge is the word yada, which appears in the Old Testament 950 times and has a wider definition than the word no. A yada is not limited to intellectual information or abstract cognition. It is not simply comprehension, but it is apprehension of reality. 
Yada is not comprehension, but it is apprehension of knowledge. Very important. Yada in the Old Testament often refers, it's a word that is used in Jewish marriages. It is not referring to the sex act. Yada is referring to the harmony of souls that produces the sex act. The harmony, the coming together and uniting as one and sharing in each other's life and destiny. When you come to know God, it is not simply an exercise of the cerebrum. It's not simply a collection of facts about God. When you know God, it means that you and him are in a united relationship and what is his is yours and you are becoming like him. Sometimes I find that when people are married, they, they start looking like one another. They start behaving like one another. That's what God wants. That's what the word yada literally means. The New Testament's definition is, is similar. There are two words in the New Testament. One is ginosko. Ginosko and the other one is oida. And according to the John Darby commentary, ginosko signifies taking in knowledge or coming to know or recognizing or understanding something completely. While oida refers to experiencing that knowledge. It means something you know through living experience. That thing working into your life. Not knowledge of doctrine, but having God's life become your life. I hope you are understanding what I'm saying. Jesus does not want you to know about him by pumping the facts of this Bible in, inside of you. Jesus wants you to know him by experiencing him, by coming to be like him. Oida knowledge of God means that his supernatural thoughts are your thoughts. And his supernatural will is your will. It is the life of Christ in you. Our thoughts, our emotions, our desires, our will in sync with God. One heart with God. Singularity. Singularity. Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh... I live by the faith of the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. I am crucified with him. We are one. Ah, this is wonderful. In the Greek, oida comes from the root word idon. And it means to see. So oida knowledge means to see. To oida something is to see it the way it was designed by its originator. To see it exactly the way God sees it. Jesus was always enamored by how his disciples perceived him. And he would ask them, who am I to you? And it, 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 it befundled him that they couldn't answer the question, yet they were living his life with him. He said once in John 8, 55, Yet you have not known him, but I know him, referring to the Father. And if I say I don't know him, I shall be a liar like you. I find that to be a powerful passage. I'm going to start it again. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you because you're supposed to know him. He created you to reflect him. But I know him and I keep his word. So when at the end of his ministry, Philip asks him, show us the father. Jesus was, he, he, he was disturbed. Philip, have I been so long with you and you are still asking me to show us the Father. He who has seen me has seen the Father. Christ is saying, I am the expression of the Father. I live out the Father. 
Everything you see about me is the Father. I do nothing of my own. My Father is in me and I am in my Father. And I want you to be in me and I in you. That's the objective of why God created us. That we would just not just know God with our mind and know biblical facts, but we would enter into the experience of Jesus Christ and to become like him. Oh, it goes a little further. It, it, it refers to grasping something or laying hold of something and making it your own. So it is not comprehension, it's apprehension. It's getting it. It's getting it. Have you been reading a passage of scripture and you've read it many times but you never got it? And then one day you read that thing and you get it. It enters into you and it now energizes you. Now you know that nobody can mess with you because now you know who you are because you got it. Philippians 3.12 says, Paul is speaking. He says, not that I have already attained or I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also, also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, not comprehended, but apprehended. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things that are ahead. What are those things? Everything that Jesus Christ is, he is grabbing for that. He wants to become that. Knowledge is the... Knowledge is connected to purpose. And everything you come to know will fulfill its purpose in you. Everything you come to know has a purpose. And that thing will install itself inside of you and manifest its purpose. Because knowledge has purpose. Knowledge culminates. My third point, the culmination of knowledge. Knowledge is not just information. It begins with acquisition of information, but it culminates in actualization. To know God is not just to perceive him or be informed of him or even to understand him. To know God is to appropriate him, to exercise him, to actualize him, to have him live out through you. So knowledge then comes in a few steps, four steps. Number one, it begins with cognition. It is acquiring and understanding information. For you to be saved, you have to get information. You must know the gospel. But knowing the gospel is not enough. The second stage is relation. You must enter into a relationship with God. That's what salvation is. You accept in Jesus Christ so that the Spirit of God comes and abides with you. And you are now called his son. So it goes from cognition to relation to integration. Now everything that he is that entered inside of you is now integrated inside of you. So that you and him become seamless. Seamless. Jesus Christ was God and man seamlessly. God's desire and design is for you to be him, for him to be in you seamlessly, for you to fully integrate God inside of you so that you don't have a secular life and a sacred life. Your whole life is sacred. The final step is transformation. So God does not want you to just integrate in. He wants you to be transformed so he can express himself outwardly that's the objective so that you now become the visible representation of God the expression of God knowledge of God is the most valuable resource a human being can possess but it is not simply intellectual comprehension it is acceptance of a person an incremental transformation into that person's image. And that is done by the Holy Spirit. 
That is because Jesus is the exact image of God. Colossians 1.15 said, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn, or the prototype of all creation. He is the pattern. He is what Adam should have been. The tree of life is him. Eternal life is sharing the life of Jesus so that Jesus' life can flow out of you and be shared with others. John chapter 17 verse 3 said, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That is the knowledge. That is the knowledge. So let me put it all together for you. God created man to be uh, the image and expression of himself on earth. When Adam fell, we lost all connection with God and the divine or heavenly realm. We had no idea who God was. And since we were made in his image, we then have no idea who we are. The only image we know is the image of Adam that's passed down to us through procreation. And because our spirit was dead, we could not by our own ability find God. So God sent Jesus Christ to be a human being. The second Adam to be obedient as Adam was not. To pay the penalty of sin and redeem humanity. While on earth Jesus was who we were supposed to be. The image of God on earth. Jesus is the firstborn or the prototype for every believer. He is the image of the invisible God. The Bible says the firstborn of all creation, Colossians 1.15. So the better we know Jesus, the better we know who we are. The culmination of knowledge of Jesus is that we become like him. And he says, it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but one day we shall see him. And the Bible says, we shall be like him. And we shall see him as he is. To becoming like Jesus Christ in creed, character, and conduct is what summarizes all of life. We are predestined, the Bible said, to be conformed to his image. If you want to know what you are supposed to be, look at Jesus Christ. He is your pattern. He is your example, your prototype. Knowledge is not abstract. It is alive. It is not simply mental reflex. It is relative experience that is either conforming your spirit into the carnal world around you or transforming it into Christ, who is the image of God. But you cannot be transformed into what you don't know. Your transformation is based on your level of knowledge. And that is why you have to know Christ better. That is why the spirit of knowledge comes to help you know Christ better. That is why we have to increase our knowledge of him. And by this, I do not mean increase informational consumption. I mean that we begin to see Jesus Christ in every experience of life. Someone says, WWJD, what would Jesus do? To see our life transformed in every choice we make, that we behave like people who are conquerors, because that's what Christ is, and more than conquerors. Knowledge is dynamic. It is alive. Every moment of it is alive. You are, trans, you, are a, you, you are transacting living thoughts, ideas, perceptions every second, every day. Knowledge is not a compartment called brain or, or mind. Knowledge is spirit. It is constantly moving you, conforming you, transforming you. Knowledge reveals purpose. And it moves a spirit towards destiny. Which for the believer culminates in the conformity into the glorious image of Jesus Christ. Oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer. This is my constant longing and prayer. 
The knowledge of Jesus is the religion of the universe. All universe was designed to declare it. This knowledge is not conducted by religious men, but it's conducted by only one divine conductor. My last point. The biggest obstacle of spirit knowledge is the means by which we try to conduct it. We are talking about the conductor of knowledge. Spiritual knowledge cannot be conducted by the body's brain or the soul's mind. They are not conductors of spirit knowledge or the right organ for morality. And so I want to read Ephesians 1, 16 into your hearing as we come to a close. Paul says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward you who believe according to the working of his mighty power? Ah, oh, God wants to work everything that is in Jesus for you. Jesus did not need the power and the glory. He had it already and he went back to it. He got it so he can give it to us. To know in the spirit, to order in the spirit. We need special eyes. The eyes of our spirit must be opened. You have to begin to see things as God sees it. The eye of the spirit is conceptual. What I mean by that is you have to see things at their root. See what causes things. Get to the heart of things. That's what spirit seeing is. Every spirit was created by God. Your spirit is God breathed. God's word is God breathed. Your spirit knows truth. And all the heart needs in order to see is the light that comes from the Holy Spirit. I just want to, be, to close right now by letting you know that the world system is predicated upon the exclusion of God from its institutions and from life. We don't want God in our schools. We don't want God in our medical institutions. We don't want God in our governments. We are expelling God the way Adam did. But the foundation and source of all knowledge is God. Without the knowledge of him, all knowledge is futile. As believers, we, de we desire to be like the Lord, to know him experientially. But we cannot do so by our own strength and by our own means. To truly know Jesus, we need the fear of the Lord. It is the beginning of knowledge. That's what we'll be talking about next week. The fear of God. It is the missing ingredient in the church today. There has never been a revival without the resurgence of the fear of God. You can ask for revival all you want. It will not come until there is a renewal of the fear of God. It is the beginning of knowledge. You have the same opportunity that Adam had. You have the same choice to make. Adam had to choose from the tree of life or to choose from doing things his way. You have the same choice. I ask you to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. Enter into a union with him. Enter into a relationship with him that is permanent and reap for yourself everlasting life. Don't reason away what I'm saying. The alternative is to believe the lie of the enemy and to spend eternity in a place that was designed for the devil and his angels. 
If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, would you do so now? You could close your eyes and just say this prayer after me. Don't put it off. Dear God, forgive me of my sins. I believe that you sent Jesus Christ to pay the penalty of my sins. I accept what he did on the cross for me. I ask you to save me. I ask you to accept me into your kingdom. I now make Jesus Christ my Lord forever. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you made that decision, can you just communicate with us in the comment section? Just say, I accept the Jesus Christ as my Lord. It has been a great joy just bringing the gospel to you and have you experience Central. We are so joyed. Next week we are, we are going to uh, participate in Mother's Day and I'm encouraging you to even if we are shut in place, wherever you are, do something special for your mother. Let's celebrate it. Central people, I'd love you to post something that you did special for your mother. Let's post it up on our website. Let's do something uh, incredibly great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We are now going to segue into the Lord's Supper. Let me invite the good Deacon, Deacon Anderson, to come and help me out here. Doing, Pastor. Oh, very good, very, very good, very good. Very good. Now, these right. days, we understand that we are in an environment where we're going to have to sanitize, you know. Yes. So, let's take care of that right now. Front and back. Everyone sees that, that we are taking the necessary precautions. We encourage you to do that at home. Wash your hands regularly and take the caution that you need to take. But now we are going to go into the Lord's Supper, Deke. And, and you know, you were in Israel with, with, with us, right? Yes, We correct. were there together yes. and we, we got a chance to go to the upper room. What, what, what an experience. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, might not give anything to, to have been there in the upper room that night with Jesus. Oh, man, how awesome would that be? Just to be in his presence, uh, spirit of overflowing, feeling like the, uh, how it's going to be when we, the new Jerusalem descends from heaven. As he announced it. Amen. As he announced it. Mm -hmm. But it, it, was, it was a very relaxed and atmosphere. Uh, as a matter of fact, <coughs> Michelangelo shows, you know, the picture of Christ at the table, mm -hmm. this high western table. It wasn't like that at all. Uh, as a matter of fact, they, they, re, they, they reclined on the floor. That's how they ate. Let me show you, let me show you. Everyone actually would go on his left side. And so they would recline. That's how they ate. They reclined and your food was right here. And that's how John was able to <clears throat> lean on his breast. It's amazing. It was a very relaxed, mm -hmm. casual, very intimate environment as he spoke about the Lord's Supper, which actually mm -hmm. was a, an ordinance, a, a mm -hmm. covenant. Yes, yes. Of, of a marriage yes. between God and His church. Yes. Wonderful. Wonderful. It's, it's, it's <clears throat> incredible. Uh, uh, when, you, when you think of, I mean, why would Jesus Christ even, why would He do this as the sign of the covenant? What, what, was, what is the purpose of mm -hmm. this Lord's Supper to you? Well, with this tremendous and most important event that's taking place, our Lord wanted us to remember this. Remember. He never wanted us to forget what sacrifice that he has made in following the will of God. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because with the Jews, when he did the Passover, mm -hmm. he told them to make it a memorial. Yes. So every Passover, yes. the Jews had to remember what happened. That's right. Mm -hmm. This is our Passover, and he wants us to remember. Remember, remember. Never to forget. Hallelujah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So... 
I want to just segue to you and ask you to do what you do best and continue with the Lord's Supper. Amen. Thank you. At this time, before we partake of the Lord's Supper, we would like for everyone to take this time to cleanse their heart. Uh, this is a time of repentance. As before we go before, before before we go before the Lord's table, to if there's anything that's on your heart that needs to be removed, that needs to help you purify your heart, do this at this time. We will take a moment for you to do this. present this to you before we get into the communion that <clears throat> during this time it had been known that anyone that had partaken of the, of the elements of our Lord that if your heart wasn't pure enough if you have some sin still remaining in you that some have been known to be sick to become sick some had also been known to have fallen asleep at this time and that was the reason that we asked for the repentance of your heart beforehand, before we take up the Lord's Supper. So at this time, we will celebrate our, uh, the death and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior at this time. We will partake of the, the unleavened bread or the crackers that you have at your homes at this time. momentous occasion that night when the disciples were celebrating the Lord's Supper, the last supper of our Lord, that he was sitting back and he raised forward and he told them to partake of this bread, my body, that is for your sake. He says, he, he prayed over it said to them, eat, eat all of it. Let's partake of it. And then, shortly afterwards, he leaned forward again. He raised up the cup, and he stated that this cup is my shared blood, my covenant with you for the forgiveness of sin. Please drink all of it. Then our Lord stated <clears throat> that we not we will not partake of the fruit again with him until the new kingdom arrives. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is wonderful, wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for being with us this week from my home to your home. Again, this is Pastor Zanak Zamor, pastor of Exciting Central Tampa Baptist Church and Deacon Kenny Anderson. Thanking you for coming. We look forward again uh, next week when we'll we'll speak on the fear of the Lord, the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Of all seven spirits, 
This is probably the most important spirit. It opens the gateway to knowledge and to sight and to hearing and to all perceptions that fear of the Lord. It's a joy coming into your home and we thank you so much for coming. See you next week. The Lord bless you.